Hello and welcome to the Church Triumphant. My name is Matt Newton. I'm the associate pastor here. And we want to tell you a little bit about us, a little bit about TCT. Our vision is to honor God, to love people, and to transform the world. That's who we are. It's a part of our DNA. In everything we do, we want to honor God. In everything we want to do, we want to love people just as Jesus loved. And in doing so, we have the ability to transform the world. We want to make sure that you know what's happening around here at the Church Triumphant. On Sundays, our services are at 11 o'clock, 11 a.m., and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. We have campus discipleship. We have all four levels of our discipleship program. The youth are in the chapel. The kids have things going on. And pastor or another one of our ministry leaders will be in the sanctuary. We hope you can join us not just online but also in person. We would love to connect with you. As the body of believers, we believe in community, and we are thankful for this online presence. We're also thankful and look forward to you joining with us very, very soon. My name is Benny McDonald. I'm the executive pastor here at the Church Triumphant, and we are excited to have you with us today. At the Church Triumphant, our vision is to honor God, love people, and transform the world. And we want your life to be transformed today by your time here with us. At the Church Triumphant, we have an amazing ministry team, not only here in the sanctuary where you're enjoying our worship service today, but also upstairs with our Triumph Kids Live and we have Bible studies and many opportunities to touch God and reach people throughout the week. Thank you for joining us today, for being a part of our mission to honor God, love people, and transform the world. God bless you. Greetings and praise the Lord, everyone. We are so glad that you are here for Wednesday Recharge. We are excited. We always love to clap to start the evening. And of course, many are still 
walking in right now and getting a part of our discipleship classes all over our campus on this lovely Wednesday evening. We have young people upstairs, D classes, one, two, three, and four, discipleship is happening, and we are excited. Thank you so much for being a part of our sanctuary class tonight. Last week, we kind of started on, I say kind of started, we kicked in uh, to gear on the book of Ephesians, and we started with Ephesians 6 and then went to Ephesians 1 uh, to talk about the beginning, that the finally, my brethren, is a, means it's a continuation of everything that we have already seen. So let's stand up together, if you will, to kind of get our minds um, and our hearts and everything kind of transitioned. Uh, when we stand up, it just kind of tells us it's time for a change. So let's get our minds and our hearts in gear. Let's lift our hands to Jesus and ask him to refresh us tonight and help us to be ready for his word. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be together. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, oh God, in this place on a Wednesday evening. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for all of our online viewers as well as all of the people of God that are, that are across our great campus. We pray tonight in Jesus' name for everyone in this room that you would help us, oh God, to flow in the spirit. We bind every resisting spirit whether human or demonic, and we pray that your perfect will will be done. Let there be an, an, an anointing, O oh God, upon the hearer as well, O oh God, as upon the speaker. And let us come, Lord Jesus, into that level of unity and oneness that makes your kingdom present. Everyone say, in Jesus' name. Jesus. Say it one more time. Jesus. In Jesus' name. Turn to two or three people and say, I'm a warrior that wins. Okay, you may be seated. I'm not just a warrior. I'm not just a warrior. I am a winner. I am a winner. Say that out loud. Say, I'm a winner. All right, Ephesians 1. Let's kind of get your Bibles out. We're going to put it up on the screens as well, and we'll just do a quick review of the first seven verses. I want you to feel the building momentum. I want you to feel the building momentum. When you read a book, it's so easy to just skim through it real fast and just get to a couple of verses that stick out to you and, oh, well, that's good, and, and that was it for today. But if you ask more of the text, it will give you more. I have preached from Ephesians, I don't know how many times, dozens of times. Every time I go back to this book, it shows me something. I see something that I missed before. So let's start with the first word, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Where did he get his name? Where did he get his name? Saul, who was also called Paul. So, so Saul was not his birth name. Paul was the name the church gave him. We say, well, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul. That was not the name his parents gave him. His, his parents gave him the name Shaul in Hebrew. It's Saul. But later on, after his dramatic conversion and being greatly used of God, they changed it. They said, no, your name's not Shaul. Your name is not Saul anymore. It's Paul. So he is starting the book saying, I'm taking on the identity that I received as a believer. I'm taking on my identity that's, that I've received as someone who has been transformed. Are there any people that have been transformed here tonight? Are you thankful that your name has been changed? So it's through this lens. And he says, Paul is the one that's the apostle. Saul, Saul was the one that persecuted people. He's the one that threw people in prison. That's the old identity. I'm going with my new identity. And in my new identity, I have a spiritual office. I'm an apostle, and I'm called. I am called to do the will of God. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. This is clarity, and I want to just say this as we start today. It's really important for you to know what God has called you to do. You need to know what the will of God is in your life. Can you say that? 
Can you say, I am a singer by the will of God. I am an intercessor by the will of God. I am a fill-in-the-blank discipleship teacher by the will of God. I am a street evangelist, evangelist uh, by the will of God. I am a Bible study. You need to know who you are and, and not be afraid to say it. And even if you don't walk around with buttons, you know, on you know what your name is or you know who you are, walking around with you know business cards, um, you know, with um, his highness on there or whatever, her, her holiness on there, uh, with your with your spiritual title. That's not necessarily uh, important for you to say it to everyone. Paul is addressing his audience, the people that he is an apostle to, the church that he raised up. Or help to raise up. Uh, so that's he's he's declaring his office or his credentials and the reason why he is writing this letter to them. But in our personal life, the Lord told me this: I want you to confess who you are in private to me. I want you to have that clarity that you confess who you are in my presence. So I want you to be able to do that. If you don't know that answer, then this is what you need to do. You need to pray until you find out. It's the first verse. Everything starts there. Your clarity is so important. The enemy will, will drive you um, into all kinds of uh, diversions, and you will, you will waffle back and forth. You will have problems um, with your own spiritual walk with God if you still don't know who you are, what you're supposed to do, and what the will of God is. I remember one year, I started the year, uh, and my goal was to get a goal. That was my goal. Now, what did that mean? I, I already had the typical ones, you know, about exercise and eating right and, you know, reading the Bible. I'm, the, those are spiritual disciplines. Those aren't goals. Those are spiritual disciplines. What I was saying is, God, what should I be living for? What is the thing that you want me to accomplish this year, when you think about when you think about this year and what you've called me to do, what should my goal be? I was asking God to enter in to the strategy of how I built out my life, and so often we just write our our, our stuff down and we're not letting God into it. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, I want to know what the will of God is. I'm going to spend some energy on that to the saints which are at Ephesus, and we read this last week. The word saints here is hagios, hagios. It's, uh, it's a derivative of, of hagios. So holy or holy ones. Holy or holy ones. So hagios is holy. Hagios uh, is holy ones. So he is saying that it is through the lens now of people who are set apart to God. That this book is for people that are wanting to walk in the holiness of God. And then he says specifically to Ephesus and to the faithful, thank the Lord for the second phrase there, to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So it applied to Ephesus, letting us know the context. So when we did our research, we could see the background of that region. We could understand what that city was all about, the things that were done in that city, the worship to Diana, for example, that was going on the great temple of Diana of the Ephesians. So this is giving us some context. You can go back to the book of Acts and see the history in the book of Acts there about Ephesus and uh, read into other sources about church history, about Ephesus. We learn that this was the largest church in the, uh, in the first century. It had at one time 100,000 disciples. Wow. So this is why it's important for us to know who the letter is written to. These are to these are this is written to people that are highly successful. They have been big producers. How many want our church to be a, a hundred thousand members? I would like to see our church be a hundred. Wouldn't that be great to be Ephesus right here in Houston, Texas? It's possible. Do you know we have more than the state of Louisiana and just in the in the city of Houston? We have whole states that live inside of our city. How many churches are in, uh, are in Louisiana? They say if you take a rock and you hit a tree, four evangelists will fall out in any, <laughs> any city in Louisiana. 
There are churches everywhere, evangelists everywhere. Uh, but we have, we have that, that big. So um, we have 200 churches just in Houston alone, but we want to see it grow. We want to be greatly successful. And then to the faithful. So he says it includes the faithful. But again, he's giving us a context. He didn't just say um, people that go to church. But he says to the faithful. And when he throw this, throw this out there for us, oftentimes we are completely reliant upon the faithfulness of God. How many are thankful for the faithfulness of God? God will not deny himself. He abides faithful. And you can hear that song in your background right now. He's been faithful, faithful to me. Looking back. Oh, well, okay. Your love and mercy I see. Okay. We think about faithful, the faithfulness of God. How much have we, have we relied upon God's faithfulness? But when you see this book, God is also relying on ours. The church is the church that it is because people are faithful. If everyone was as faithful as you, what kind of church would this be? If everybody in the church acted just like you, what kind of church would this be? So to the faithful in Christ Jesus, I ask myself that question. So I dance and I worship because I, I want our church to be a church that obeys the word of God and, and is expressing themselves in worship. And if I don't do it, then I can't expect anybody else to, uh, to do it. I want to lead by example. Maybe I'm a little goofy. I'm a little bit too old to be acting that way. I got gray hair now. Usually gray-haired people just come to church and stand like this. But you know what? I got young kids, and I'm going to be a vivacious 80-year-old. I used to say vivacious 60-year-old. I'm going to be a vivacious 80-year-old. I also know that David danced before the Lord, and he worshiped. He, he was the king, he was the, he, but yet he was the one that was leading the way. So leaders need to lead by example. And if we're going to get the full benefit of the book, we need to be faithful to what his word says, faithful to his people, faithful to his house, and faithful in our relationship to him. The word faithful means uh, it, it is a derivative of pistis, which we also get the word faith from. Uh, so trusty or faithful of persons who show themselves faithful in transactions of business, execution of commands, and the discharge of of official duties. So we're talking about people that are reliable. I want you to ask this question of yourself. Am I reliable? Can God trust me? Look at your neighbor. Say, I want to be trustworthy. I want to be trustworthy. All right, so let's continue on. The salutations, all this happens through what? It happens through grace. Everyone say grace. Thank God for grace. We cannot be holy without grace. We cannot be faithful without grace. We can't know the will of God without grace. We can't be sent uh, without grace. We can't have a new identity without grace. All of it comes through grace. Grace and peace. Peace is essential for us uh, to walk in a spiritual authority. Spiritual authority produces peace in our lives. From God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Can't get any higher than that. The grace and peace that I have comes directly from him. Now, verse 3, and here's where the momentum starts to build. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Everyone say, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So here's some other things that we need to see. We are up on top of something. What is our position as we begin? Heavenly places. Everyone say, heavenly places. Our beginning point, our default place. Someday I'm going to get on top. No. When you're born of the water and born of the spirit, he puts you on top. You start on top. You don't have to work your way up. Well, someday I'm going to be as good as by the glass. I don't know what it was. I'll ascend to that high place in the spirit. I don't know what it is. You know, you heard, that, you heard me tell that story about this little uh, church. I, I preached that out in central Kentucky. And I can tell you funny stories about that all night. Here's one to make you laugh. 
there was a trucker that used to drive through that little town, and he'd listen to the tiny little radio station there. But the, the little preacher that preached at this tiny radio station, uh, he would always open his show. He would say, hello, America. <laughs> so he thought that because if you're on the radio, everyone in America could hear you if you're on the radio. And so this trucker was driving by and happened to hear him, waited till he got to Texas, and then wrote him a card and said, hearing you loud and strong. <laughs> and so, so he got up and said, I just got a note from Texas. He goes, hello, America. So that was awesome. <laughs> Those were fun people. They were great people. We were having a, <clears throat> we were having a, a, a meeting where they were trying to bring as many young people together in one place to have, to have a rally. And there was one, one independent church that came. And they were all so sober, so sincere, so modest, um, so um, focused. You could see it, but none of them were happy. None of them were happy at all. Um, and finally, I was like, I'd go back and try to meet them. Say, how? Hi, how are you? Shake their hand. How are you doing? And they would all answer the same way. I'm striving. I'm striving. That was their, that was their byword where I'm striving. And the whole church was a striving church. And what that meant was they didn't believe that anybody there was saved yet. They were all still striving. And I said, well, have you been baptized in Jesus' name? Yes. Have you got the Holy Ghost? Yes. You know, and what is it? Well, until you're at that level of holiness, until your life is perfection, until you have achieved into this high level, you're just striving. They said the pastor died recently, and they didn't know if he made it or not. I was like, man, you are striving. I mean, you know, I said, Wow. There was only one guy in the church that everyone agreed uh, was ready for the rapture. He was the only guy. <laughs> I was like, like, can I meet him? He's not here tonight. <laughs> Apparently, he didn't need the extra services. But I realized that sometimes very sincere people, and this is a, an extreme case, but we can live our life feeling that way. That I'm striving, that I'm, I'll never quite get there. I'm, I'm always trying to reach for it. When will I ever be blessed? And Paul is saying, look, you are blessed. I want you to know that when you became a part of the body of Christ, he set you in heavenly places with Christ. Because what you receive and who you are is not based upon where you came from. It's not based upon your family. It's not based upon how hard you work. It's based upon the grace of God. And since it's God's grace, then let's receive what God says he wants us to have, not what the devil says, what what we're still trying to earn or be good enough to deserve none of us deserve it I I love um, Dave Ramsey's phrase about himself they say how are you doing he said better than I deserve so I want you to turn to two or three people and say I'm better than I deserve grace grace says that I am blessed right now with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Verse number four, I'm hearing other songs in my head, and I'm just just pushing away the temptation to keep singing. Okay. (laughs) Verse number four, and he says, Now it's according to, which this blessing, he says, is according to something. It's according as he hath chosen us. I want you to say again, say, I'm chosen. Now he said, He said, Paul says, he chose us before the foundation of the world. You were not an afterthought. The church was not a plan B. Even when he called Abraham, he had the church in mind. When the Jewish people were still uh, in their formation stages, God's plan was for a church before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him and were held in his love. Everyone say his love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure 
of his will. All of this was done by the will of God. All of this was because it pleased God. When he saw the church transformed and radiant and glorious, he smiled and said, yes, that's what I'm after. I'm going to give free will to mankind. Not everyone is going to choose me, but those that do, I am going to extraordinarily bless them. I am going to let them sit with me in heavenly places. They are going to be the praise of the glory of my grace, the Bible says, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted. Embraced. Hallelujah. Verse number four, or verse number seven, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the richness, riches of his grace, but having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. That's the word we missed, adoption of children. So let's just go through the words here just for a minute. Say, I'm blessed. Say, I'm chosen. Say, I'm predestined. Say, I'm adopted. And say, I'm a praise. And finally, say, I'm accepted. I'm accepted in the beloved. Now, individuals, let's talk about predestination just for a minute, just so we don't get uh, off track here when we use that term. I believe what this is saying, predestination is that God is showing us his plan for those that say yes to him. That this is what I have predetermined or foreordained to be done. If you choose it, this is what you get. If you choose not to walk in that way, that's your choice. God's not going to make you go to heaven. God's not going to make you live for him. God's not going to make all your choices for you every day. You're, you're, not, you're, not, uh, you're not going to live a perfect life. Um, you're going to make some mistakes in your life because you have free will. But when he talks about bringing predestined, he's talking about the church itself. The entity of the church is predestinated. And because we are in the church, we now have that destiny. Does that make sense? Okay, and so that is the choosing. That he, but he is saying, I went after you. I went after you. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I went after you. So I want to talk to you about this just a, another second here. Many years ago, I had an, a life-changing experience in which God revealed to me the love of God. All these things, he said, were accepted in the beloved. All of this is, is that we are without blame before him in love. It all flows out of the love of God. I had a misconception about God's love. And I was trying to bring my understanding of God's love uh, through the lens of my human experience with love. And so I was trying to take that experience and then put it forward towards my relationship with God. But the Bible plainly tells us that our fathers, if ye being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more will your father give you the Holy Ghost? What he is saying is God is so much more. That's why John 4 tells us here in his love, not that we loved God. Everyone say, not that we loved God. But that he loved us. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. So what, what John is telling us is that if you're going to understand God's love, you have to first take the human aspect of love out. And you have to let God define what love is and then bring God's love into your human experience rather than putting your human experience and, and, and putting that into the category of how God's love is. My human experience was if I did good, my dad would pat me on the back. If I did bad... It's a little lower and a little harder, okay? <laughs> he would apply, what was it, the stick of instruction to the seat of learning? No. <laughs> and so when I'm coming into the presence of God, 
I'm having the same thing. I'm, I, I feel like that if I'm not good enough, if I've made a mistake, I wasn't, you know, God, man, he's got his switch out. Man, he, he's, he's, Gabriel, go get me a switch right now. I mean, he's already, I mean, he's ready to do this. We're going to do this again, again, boy, you know. The problem is I could never be good enough. And so, again, we're, we're, I'm back to, I'm striving, you know. <laughs> Now, in all of this, it doesn't mean that we are inactive, that we are just fatalistic in our life and just, you know, okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. I'm like, um, that's not, it's easy to see, okay, Sarah, Sarah. No, it's, I mean, that's not what we're doing either. I don't know why I'm singing tonight. So it's, it's hard to stop. But. I needed God to reveal his love to me. And, and, and I needed him to, exp- to show me that it was unconditional. I needed to know the why. I said, God, why would you love me? You know the truth about me. You know what everybody else doesn't know. You know the things that I can't bear to even see in myself. You know the worst about me. And that's the reality of God's love. God decided to love you and me on prior knowledge of the worst about us. Yet he still loves us with perfect love. Now what is perfect love? Perfect love is not waiting until you're perfect before he loves you. Perfect love says, I know every imperfection, but I love you as though you were already perfect. How many are thankful for the love of God tonight? Clap your hands to him for a moment. When God revealed his love to me, uh, I don't have time to go any further with it, but it was, it was life-changing. It was life-changing. And God began to answer questions. I began to hear his voice so clearly. And one of the things that he told me during that time is he said, many people, many people think that there are only preachers that have specific will of God and that the rest of the church just has my general will. He said, but I want you to go and tell my people that I have a perfect plan. I have a perfect will for every single person. I want them to know that. I was so excited the next time I got to preach to tell, to tell everyone there. It's not just for certain people that God has details and God has specifics, but God has details and specifics for every single one of you, every single one of us. Are you thankful that God loves us that way? So tap into the good, good pleasure of his will. He delights in that. And when you are in the body of Christ, he said, I have a specific plan. And Jeremiah would write, I know the plans that I have for you, thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. All right, so we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Verse 8, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Abundance. Everyone say abundant wisdom. And abundant prudence. So wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom. So we have access to all wisdom. And this is Sophia in the Greek. Sophia broad and full of intelligence used of knowledge of, ev- of, of very diverse matters. The wisdom which belongs to men, etc. The act of interpreting dreams. The intelligence. It, it's several definitions here. There are... Uh, Nine different definitions. There is a lot just in this one uh, Greek word of wisdom and prudence. What is prudence? The word prudence here is mental action or activity, understanding, knowledge. So knowledge and prudence. Having made known unto us, here it is. Here's our scripture for all of it. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. So the will of God was a mystery before the church was manifested. It was in the mind and the heart of God from the foundation of the world. 
But until the church came into existence, it was a mystery. In the Old Testament, it was a mystery. They didn't quite see it or understand it yet. They knew something more was coming, but they didn't know what it was. But now, God is not concealing. He is revealing. The Old Testament is the will of God concealed. New Testament is the will of God revealed. Moses has his face covered. Jesus has his face uncovered. We are in a time of revelation. And so the Bible says that he has made known unto us. I can know it. I want you to say, I want you to say it with me. Say, I can know it. We can know the mystery of God's will. It does, we don't need to walk around. Well, I don't know if we're ever going to know the will of God. That's not the will of God for us to walk around wondering about the will of God. The will of God is for us to know the will of God. According to his good pleasure. Again, he's happy about it. He's not begrudgingly. He doesn't say it. And just to his holy apostles and prophets, he reveals it. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. He's happy to do it for his church, for those who are faithful, for his saints that are living their lives to please him. It's the good pleasure which he purposed in himself. And you know what he is saying? He is saying, I put it in myself. I purposed it in myself to make sure it got done. When he swore to Abraham, he swore by himself. He said, I swear by myself, I'm going to bless you. He could swear by the sun, but the sun's going to eventually burn out. But before there was a sun and after there's a sun, God is going to be there. He could swear by everything in time and space, but guess what? In Revelations 10, there's an angel that stands on the sea and on the land, and time will be no more. But the God who is eternal will remain. There is something that there is something that we could point to, we could say as faithful as that clock, but that clock may, may, not, may not work anymore. But let me tell you something, God is faithful. There is none higher than himself, so he purposed it in himself. I swear by myself that it's going to happen. He put it based upon his own nature and his in, immutability of his word. Now, what is this that he purposed? That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, this purpose, this is now showing us the reason why God became a man, why the word became flesh. This is the reason why Jesus walked among us, why he went to the cross. Paul is giving us the clarity of this. It's called a dispensation. The dispensation of the fullness of times. Now he's telling the church at Ephesus. He is saying, you need to know where you are on God's prophetic time clock. So not just knowing his will, but also knowing his time. God once showed me a vision of a, uh, of a safe, and it had a key, and then it also had a dial. If you ever see the two key versions, they'll have. If you have a safety deposit box, the bank has a key, and you have a key. So to verify it, to make sure that nobody can come in with somebody else's key, and their identity is not verified. If you have the right identity, they can look at your paperwork, they'll, they'll go in and they'll, they'll put in their key and then you better have that, you put it in like this. It's the same way. Is that as in heaven, so in earth, let thy will be done. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's better said what is bound in heaven is bound in earth. And what is released in heaven we release on the earth. That's better translated that way. So God puts his key in what the will of God is, and then we align ourselves with that will in agreement, and we put our key in. There's also another, another system, another principle of how this works, and that is when the timing of God and the will of God come together. So sometimes the combination is the timing of God. So the timing of God and the will of God are not always the same thing. 
So we could say it was the will of God for me to pastor in Pasadena, but not when I was four. God knew I was going to end up here. When he called me to preach, he knew I was going to end up in Pasadena, Texas at 1030 Strawberry Road. I had no idea. I had no idea. I came here for a wedding when my cousin uh, got married to Mark Crothers. Mark and Lori Crothers. That, Lori's my, one of my oldest cousins. And I came and stood over here. I was even in the wedding. And they had the orange carpet. The lovely orange carpet days. And I remember thinking, man, this is a really big building. That's all I remember. <laughs> had no idea I would ever someday be here. But God knew I was going to be here. And when the timing of God and the will of God came together... Here I am. So Paul is trying to let them know that there was a, this was always in the mind of God. The church was always in the mind of God. It was a mystery because it wasn't time yet. But now it's time. And he says, I want you to understand that he purposed this in himself when he came. And so now we are under a dispensation. We need to know what your time frame is. It's a dispensation of fullness of times. Everyone say fullness of times. What does that mean? Anybody know what fullness of times means? Anybody want to take a guess at it? What does it mean, fullness of times? Anybody? It's okay, yes. That's good. Let's take it one more layer. Let's go one more layer in, but thank you for that. I think that's really good. The word time here is kairos, not chronos. Um, if, you have a, uh, if you have a wristwatch, I, I've got a, I'm wearing an Apple watch tonight. I've got several different kinds of watches. Uh, if you have one that, and I, my dad willed me one, uh, and I, it was a winder. <laughs> Had to wind it. <laughs> When I took it to the watch guy, he said, I haven't seen one of these in a while. <laughs> I have to wind them up. Usually I have a battery now, right? That's a, that's a, a watch that tells you, it's a chronograph. A clock is a chron It's just telling you seconds and minutes. And then if you have one that has days on it, it uh, days, that's chronology. So not in the fullness of chronos, but in the fullness of Kairos. So kairos is appointed times. A kairos is a specific moment that God said, this is on my calendar when I'm going to do something. So when he told Daniel and he showed him the image, he was giving him the high points of his kairos, of different specific events on his calendar that were coming. And telling us how many days and where we get Daniel 70 weeks from and all this stuff. He's lining out the, the chronos and then showing us the kairos moments within the progression of God. So in this context, what we are seeing is the fullness of times. He is saying that since Jesus has come and his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And we'll see the ascension later on in chapter 4. But... He said, since then, we are now in a new dispensation in which we call the fullness of times. So let, let, me, let me say it to you this way. The prophets were all telling us that someday, 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 someday. And what Paul said is that someday is now today. That in this dispensation, everything that the prophets prophesied is going to come to pass. Full times. Full times means times of fulfillment. That's why Peter on the day of Pentecost said, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. I'll pour up my spirit upon all flesh. In the book of Joel, it doesn't say, it doesn't say last days. It says something else. It shall come to pass afterwards that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Afterwards. He is saying it's not now, it's later. But Peter gets up and says, this is that. 
This is the afterwards. We're in the afterwards now. Someday is now today. It's the last days or days in which God will fulfill everything that he spoke through the prophets. How many are thankful that we are living in the times of fulfillment? So he is saying we need to know our time. Know who you are, know the will of God, and then know the timing of God that he might gather together. Now what's the purpose of this dispensation? What are all these prophecies about? Fixing things in heaven and fixing things in earth. That he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Now, I don't know how far we want to go with this today. But this is showing us that Calvary solved the fall of Satan and the fall of man. The division in heaven and the division in earth. Calvary fixed them both. There's about eight hours of teaching just right in that one sentence. But I will, I will just be brief in saying it this way. Heaven used to be united, and then there was a problem. Now, there's a lot of debate about this. We have just accepted a lot of things. Um, show me the place in the Bible where a third of the angels fell. I can show you Revelations 12 where a dragon took his tail and a third of the stars fell with him. A dragon with a tail with a third of the stars. That's the only possible inference that a third of the angels fell. It doesn't say angels, it says stars, but of course the dragon there we know to be, in symbolism, to be Satan. But we also know that there is a lot of other things going on as you begin to study the unseen realm. You begin to study the spiritual realm. You realize that God does have other counsels besides man. When you go to Job chapter 1, that the sons of God gathered together and Satan came also. God has a counsel about his throne. When you go to the book of Psalms, and let's just take a look at this. I'll give you one tiny little peek here. Psalms 84. Let's take a look at this, and we'll do a little bit of Hebrew uh, with this. This is Bible study, and I hope you're in for, the, for this. <clears throat> I'm sorry, 84. Sorry. All right, 82. I'm sorry. I said 84. 82. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. <laughs> All right, so let's read it in Hebrew now. The word God here in Hebrew is Elohim. Elohim standeth in the congregation of the mighty. Standeth here is a verb. And it is singular, talking about the noun of God being Elohim. So God is singular. God standeth in the congregation. This is the congregation is Idah or Ada. And then of the mighty, the word mighty is El. Word for God. So God stands in the congregation of the, of the El. He judges among the Elohim, gods. So Elohim judges among the Elohim. Is God judging himself? So this is plural. This is a plural uh, context in the second phrase, singular context in the first phrase. God singular 
stands in the congregation, and he judges, plural, among the gods, plural. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, Selah? Well, this is a, this is a very, uh, very deep theological uh, discussion. goes back to Deuteronomy 32. So let's, let's look at Deuteronomy 32 for a minute. And we'll see one more, one more inference there. Obviously, in Psalms 82, he is judging them. He is saying that you failed. You did not do what you were supposed to do. So who are these Elohim? This is the council of heaven. These are the sons of God. These are, these are beings that God created as a part of his council from the foundation of the world. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Michael Heiser, who, is a, who just recently passed away, is a high-level theologian. He actually helped uh, put the Logos Bible software together, was one of the primary contributors. He is a Bible, uh, Bible uh, school uh, teacher, etc. Very, very uh, highly accepted he did a whole exegesis that the let us here is impossible that's talking about a trinity. It is not talking about the trinity. And he was Trinitarian. Let us make man in our image is not, it's impossible that it could be, it could be the trinity talking here. He said he is re referencing heavenly beings that are with him. God himself did it. He later would be called the El Elyon. Everyone say Elyon. That means God most high, El Elyon, God most high, that he is the highest, that there's nobody like him. He is the God of gods. He is greater than anything and anyone that ever existed or ever will exist. But God in his wisdom and in his desire to have fellowship, he created angelic beings. We would call them angelic beings. And he said, let us make man our image. So he was consulting or talking to this assembly that were with him from the foundation of the world. They were image bearers, and we are also image bearers. So verse number 7 of Deuteronomy chapter 32, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show you. Thy elders, and they will tell you when the most high, most high, El Elyon, the Most High, divided to the nations their inheritance. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Now this is our translation from the KJV. But when you read it from the other manuscripts, it is according to the sons of God or according to the Elohim. He divided them according to the number of Elohim. Verse 9, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. What God was saying here is basically, look, I'm going to be with Israel. These are my people. I've chosen them. The rest of the nations, they're going to have other gods. That's what he's saying. He divided the nations, and he set his counsel over the nations and said, you rule over them. I'm going to be with Israel. This is going to be my special people. So now let's go to Acts chapter 17. Are you still with me? Are you still following? Okay. Acts 17. So I showed you that they didn't do a good job, and this is where you get all these false religions and false gods from is that these, these Elohim became fallen angels that led the world into rebellion. So in Acts 17, Paul is teaching here to all these idolaters. He's teaching them. When you hear Paul teach about idols, the idol is nothing, but it represented something. Can you drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils? What he is saying is that when... You cannot, you cannot eat at the table of idolatry and you cannot have the Lord's Supper at the same time. Why? Because one is the cup of the Lord, relationship with God. The other is the cup of devils. So idolatry 
was directly tied into uh, bringing them into spiritual entities. Their sacrifices were there to invoke some kind of a manifestation. All right, so as Paul is teaching, he's here talking to all of these people in, in Athens who have all of, this, all of these gods. He sees a city wholly given over to idolatry. And then he begins to preach. So Paul stood up in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious, for I passed by and beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. And now he starts talking about God. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. Everyone say heaven and earth. Dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell upon all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed. He determined a time and the bounds of their habitation. This is a hint back to Deuteronomy 32. The bounds of their habitation. He divides the nations and he puts it within a time frame. He determined these times that they should seek the Lord if haply they may feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us for in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your poets have said for we are also his offspring. Now watch this. Let's keep going. Verse number 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So for a season of time, God says, Israel is my portion. I'm just working with Israel, and I'm leaving the nations to go their own ways. I will deal with them through the lens of Israel alone. But he says, now that time is over. It was times of ignorance. And he just winked. He just, I didn't see that. You know, when you see a kid do something he probably wasn't supposed to do, and you're going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pretend I didn't see that. If your mother finds out, you know. God says, I just kind of winked at that, and I just let the pagans do what the pagans do. It's ignorant. They were ignorant. He says, but now we're in a new dispensation. And he's not just dealing with Israel. He is now bringing everybody. He's calling everybody. He is bringing everybody because he was using this as a type and shadow that just as he used natural people through a covenant to be able to, to speak to the world and to deal with the Elohim over the world, to deal with all of the demons that had fallen, all of the fallen angels. He said, I dealt with them through the lens of Israel. Now, now, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he's gathering everything together in one. Everything's coming under his authority in heaven, and everything's coming under his authority in the earth, and there's no more winking. He's calling everybody into repentance because he has now dealt with all of these demonic entities and they have now been thoroughly judged. Jesus said very plainly in the book of, of John and now shall and now I shall be and now shall the son of man be lifted up and I if I be lifted up I will draw all men unto me but he tells us that the prince of this world is being cast out. How many are thankful that Jesus has stripped the enemy of his weapons? And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, Colossians 2, 14. So when we're reading that he gathered together all things in one, you have to understand this time frame here. This goes directly into our spiritual warfare at the end of this book are finally their brethren because I can now say Satan you used to get away with it but now we are authorized as the body of Christ to bring you into bondage because your season of reigning is over you have been defeated at the cross you have been judged. You have been stripped of your weapons. God is bringing everything together and it's all through Christ. It is our time. We have a kairos moment. The church is living in a kairos moment of fulfillment of God bringing everything together in himself. Wow. 
in heaven and on earth, even in him. It's all in Jesus Christ. Wow. In whom also we have obtained, everyone say obtained, an inheritance being predestined, there's that word again, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. After the counsel of his own will, he does this. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Where is our entrance point? Where did our trust begin? When you heard the word of truth. The word of truth. So our foundation of entrance is the word of truth. Notice the notice the the emphasis here. He could have used any other he could use any number of words here, but he chose word of truth. You heard the the logos of truth. And the word truth here is just as you would think. What is true in things appertaining to God and the duties of man, moral and religious truth in the greatest latitude. So this is what he is saying. In every degree, the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed with. And I love this. To stamp with a signet or private mark for security or preservation. So in those days, a king's letter, to be authenticated, he would have a ring. We, we talked about this with Haman, that, that the ring was taken from Haman's hand, and it was put on Mordecai's hand so he could seal it. Everyone knew the king's seal. So Mordecai, Mordecai went, that hot, that hot ring that had been, been in the fire, he in the wax and it puts the imprint of the seal of the king upon that letter and when they see that that means this is authenticated somebody didn't make uh, some kind of counterfeit document this is authenticated he said I have authenticated your being a part of the body of Christ by my seal the Holy Spirit coming in is the seal of of your salvation. It is what authenticates your salvation. This is why there had to be something that was evidence. There had to be something that they would hear. Something that they could see. Not just a feeling. How do you know you have the Holy Ghost? Well, I just feel that I have it. I just, I just know. There's something in here. It's in my heart. So I just feel. When I pray, I just feel warm. Well, you know, okay, well, there's lots of things that could make you feel that way. <laughs> if you, uh, you know, were 14 and put a little note and passed it to a girl, you know, and she said, yes, well, yeah, that make you would feel warm, you know, whatever. Okay. Will you go out with me? You know, here's the little note, you know, and she just drop, comes by and, you know, drops a little note back. You know, you could feel warm. If, if someone said you just got a promotion, that would make you feel warm inside. We have to have more, more than if you rolled, rode a roller coaster. You know, your hair may be standing straight up and you're feeling all kinds of things inside. Okay. You can't just go based on feelings. I need something that I know only God could do. The tongue can no man tame. Tongue can no man tame. So he takes our most unruly member and he gives us a new language. How did they know in Acts 10 that they'd received the Holy Ghost? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. That was God's seal. And he was talking to the Ephesians, remember? In Acts 19, he finds a little group of Ephesians and they were disciples. And he comes up to them and he says, have you received 
the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we, we don't know about this Holy Ghost. One translation says, what is the Holy Ghost? He says, oh my goodness, you don't have the Holy Ghost? Then how are you baptized? Well, John's baptism. He said, oh, okay. I see what happened here. You didn't hear the rest of the story. You're, you're, some of John's disciples told you about this great rabbi that was, that, that was the Messiah, and his name was Jesus. And you're just disciples of John believing in Jesus. And he said, John told us of something better that was coming. And that better something is now here. When they told him the gospel, what did they do? They got rebaptized in the name of Jesus. And then what happened? They received the Holy Spirit and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. This is the church at Ephesus. So they went from just being good believers that were disciples to people that had not yet received the Holy Spirit. And Paul had to get them into the way more perfectly and give them the rest of uh, of the gospel, and this is the seal he's talking about. God sealed this church. You when you got the Holy Ghost, that's when everything changed in your life. How many remember when you received the Holy Ghost? And I still remember it. It changed everything. I still have his stamp in my life. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all stand up together, and let's thank the Lord for the promise that we are sealed with. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Whew. After you have believed, you were sealed. Since you believed, since you believe, you might as well receive. Since you believe, you might as well receive. Let's take the full benefit of what God has given to us. And what is available to us. And let's, let's have that seal. That when hell sees us, uh-oh, they're authenticated. I have an inheritance. I've obtained an inheritance. What gives you access? Uh, I, got the family, I got the family seal here. Right this way, sir. Right this way. The Holy Spirit takes us right this way into all of this that we talked about. The blessings of God, the grace of God, the adoption, the chosenness. All of these things are evidence, uh, are, are resources after we have been authenticated in the presence of God. So let's pray one more time together. Father, thank you for this wonderful reality of your word in our lives. Thank you for this promise. Thank you for this dispensation, for the timing of God and the will of God in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, that there are so many wonderful things in your kingdom that are available to us. We are predestined. We are foreordained. Now that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, we are a part of that plan which was from the foundation of the world. And I thank you, Father, that we're going to walk in that dominion in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. Well, I hope you've been encouraged tonight. You can just clap for Jesus. Thank you for being a part of our Wednesday recharge service. God bless you. This Sunday is going to be another great, great, great Sunday. We'll see you soon.